hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions. And you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all of your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the real test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1 of your booklet. Section 1. Listen to the telephone conversation between a student and the owner of a paragliding school and answer the questions 1 to 7. Now you have some time to read questions 1 to 7. Hello. Paragliders Paradise. How can I help you? Oh, hi. I'm interested in doing a course in paragliding. Which course are you interested in? Well, I'm not sure. What's available? We... we've got the introductory course, which lasts for two days. OK. Or there's the four-day beginner's course. There's also the elementary pilot course, which takes five to six days, depending on conditions. We might try the beginner's course. What sort of prices are we looking at? The introductory is $190. The beginner's course, which is what you'd probably be looking at, is $320. No, sorry, $330. It's just gone up. And the pilot course is $430. Right. And you also have to become a member of our club so that you're insured. That'll cost you $12 a day. Everyone has to take out insurance, you see. Does that cover me if I break a leg? No, I'm afraid not. It's only third party and covers you against damage to other people or their belongings, but not theft or injury. You would need to take out your own personal accident insurance. I see. And what's the best way to get to your place? By public transport or could we come by bike? We're pretty keen cyclists. It's difficult by public transport, although there is a bus from Newcastle. Most people get here by car, though. Because we're a little off the beaten track. But you could ride here, OK? I'll send you a map. Just let me take down a few details. What's your name? Maria Gentle. And your address, Maria? Well, I'm a student staying with a family in Newcastle. So it's care of? Care of Mr. and Mrs. MacDonald. Like the hamburgers? <laughs> yes, exactly. MacDonald. The post office box address is probably best. It's P.O. Box 2492, Newcastle. Is there a fax number there? Because I could fax you the information. Yes, actually, there is. It's 0249, that is for Newcastle, and then 760412. OK. Now, if you decide to do one of our courses, you'll need to book in advance and to pay when you book. How would you be paying? By credit card, if that's OK. Do you take Visa? Yes, fine. We take all major cards, including Visa, Master and American Express. OK, then. Thanks very much. Now you have some time to read questions 8 to 10. As the conversation continues, answer questions 8 to 10. Hi, Pauline. Hi, Maria. What's that you're reading? Just some information from a paragliding school. It looks really good fun. Do you fancy a go at paragliding? Sure. Do you have to buy lots of equipment and stuff? Not really. The school provides the equipment, but we'd have to take a few things along. Such as? Well, it says here... Clothes wear stout boots, so no sneakers or sandals, I suppose. And clothes suitable for an active day in the hills, preferably a long-sleeved T-shirt. 
That's probably in case you land in the stinging nettles. It also says we should bring a packed lunch. We do not recommend soft drinks or flasks of coffee. Water is really the best thing to drink. We'd also need to bring suntan lotion and something to protect your head from the sun. Okay, that sounds reasonable. And where would we stay? Well, look, they seem to operate a campsite too, because it says here that it's only ten dollars a day to pitch a tent. That'd be fine, wouldn't it? And that way we'd save quite a bit, because even a cheap hotel would cost money. Um, or perhaps we could stay in a bed and breakfast nearby. It gives a couple of names here we could ring. I think I might prefer that. Hotels and youth hostels would all be miles away from the farm, and I don't fancy a caravan. No, I agree. But let's take a tent and pray for good weather. Okay, let's do it. What about next weekend? No, I can't. I'm going on a geography field trip. And then it's the weekend before exams, and I really need to study. Okay then, let's make it the one after the exams. Fine. We'll need a break by then. Can you ring and? This is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You are going to hear an interviewer who is interviewing Alan. He made a great discovery of Mungo National Park. First, look at questions eleven to fifteen. As you listen to the first part of the interview, answer questions eleven to fifteen. An event occurred in 1996 over a period of three days that attracted considerable attention at the time, and led to a new find in Mungo National Park, which is the focal point of the Willandra Lakes World Heritage Area in New South Wales, Australia. I talked to Alan Moore, the organizer of this trip, about his experience. Alan. What was the purpose of your trip? Well, as you know, I love the outback and lead tours of people wanting to go into more remote parts of the country. However, I thought it was time for me too to have a holiday, so I packed up my family and we went to Mungo National Park. Why did you choose this location? It holds a record of Aboriginal life stretching back over forty thousand years, and of course, I wanted my young kids to be amazed by the main feature of the park. The remarkable walls of China, as they're called, where wind and water erosion have exposed this long history. I see. What was the weather like? It was unusual for that time of year. The rain was just one continual downpour after another. We were always soaked to the skin, so we decided to cut our holiday short and only stayed three days in the end. However, it was eventful. The obvious problem was to get back to the nearest town, a small place called Buranga. But the dirt roads out there are always impassable after rain, so we settled down for a long, wet wait in the park. We didn't really mind because the scenery was so interesting. However, the kids wandered away without our noticing, and eventually we realized they must be lost. So we used our two-way radio to contact the park rangers and the police, and a helicopter was sent. Luckily, the kids were found within a few hours, but they'd made an important discovery. Now look at questions sixteen to twenty. As the talk continues, 
Answer questions 16 to 20. So the trip was also eventful for another reason, wasn't it? Yes, yes. They led us to some ancient aboriginal art. The kids had taken shelter in a very small, low cave that was difficult to see from the outside. We were lucky to have another family camping in our location. When they heard us calling the kids, they immediately helped us search for them, and as the hours went by, they also provided us with much-needed support and encouragement. We really appreciated their help, and as we were already soaked through after looking for the kids for a couple of hours, they even made sure we had enough dry clothes to wear. The park ranger managed to get through to us to lead the search, and when the helicopter pilot notified us by two-way radio that he'd seen the children but was unable to land nearby, we were able to eventually find them very excited about what was in their little cave. And what did you think of their cave? Well, after squeezing in, I must say I was impressed and managed to take a few photos of it before we left. There were many faint markings and dots on the wall. It was difficult to tell what they represented because they were so small, but people from the museum who have since visited there said the markings were similar to some other findings in the area and later confirmed they were very old. Although it's now a protected site, the children like to call it their cave and are allowed to visit it when a ranger can go with them. Thank you, Alan. If you go to Mungo National Park, you can see the entrance to the cave and some of Alan's photos at the ranger's station. Alan continues to lead tour groups in the outback, and if you want further information... This is the end of Section 2. Now you have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. You are going to hear a conversation between Sally and Ben. They are new college students. You now have some time to read questions 21 to 25. Now, listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, Ben. Sally. How are you? Fine. I wondered if I'd run into you. When did you get here? I only arrived last night, just in time. I prefer to travel on Sundays to miss the working rush. I suppose you arrived in plenty of time. Oh, I've been here for four days now. So it must have been Thursday that I arrived. I like to have a good chance to look around and settle in. I should have come earlier too. I'm hoping to get a part-time job. Well, you've no time today, I suppose. Do you still plan to be an architect? Yes. It's what I've always wanted to do. And you were planning to do economics, weren't you? Yes, I was. But now I've decided on psychology instead. How many textbooks do you have to get? I've been given this long list, and I'm sure they'll cost a fortune. See? That looks a lot. It's longer than my list. Well, it's 14, all told. So I might use library copies instead of buying some of them. What about you? I'll probably buy the whole lot of mine, because I only have five on my list. Although I'm sure there are many more I'll have to read. Luckily, we don't have to read them all straight away. Have you got your class timetable yet? It came with the book list. When do your lectures start? Tuesday. That's tomorrow. How about yours? Oh, I've got an extra day. The day after yours start. Now you have some time to read questions 26 to 30.
As the conversation continues, they are talking about their new college life. Listen carefully and answer questions 26 to 30. It's nothing like school, is it? Not so far, and the lectures will certainly be different. Do you have any special approach for keeping up with lectures and the amount we have to read? Well, I usually try to read every word in a book in case I miss something important. So I suppose I'll try to write down every word of the lecture if I can. Oh, I couldn't do that. I'd get cramp in my fingers and I wouldn't really hear what was being said. I usually skim a book when I read and underline key parts, so I guess I'll try to make notes on the main points of the lecture. Have you thought of using a cassette recorder? You mean to record the lecture? Yep. Then you could make really good notes. Is it allowed? I think so. It must be. Plenty of people seem to do it. It has to be better than trying to write every word as you listen. Anyway, what's your first lecture about? Oh, it's on the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution? Sounds boring to me. Not really. It made a big difference to everything, including architecture eventually. So what's your first lecture about? It's about what separates humans from other animals. OK. Look, I was on my way to the library to check out some of these books on my list. I have a tutorial paper to give in a couple of weeks. Oh, what's the topic? Well, I think our lecturer must have trouble thinking up topics. The topic is, why study architecture? I don't know. It could give you a chance to set out what you want to do. I guess so. Have you been given any tutorials to do yet? Yes. Mine is called Needs for Sleep. Sounds almost as interesting as mine. This is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 4. Section 4. In this section, you are going to hear a talk introducing the courses and entry requirements of the Department of Psychology. You now have some time to look at questions 31 to 35. Now listen to the first part of the talk and answer questions 31 to 35. Good morning and welcome to the Department of Psychology's Information Day for new and intending students. I'm the head of the department and today we plan to give you a clear idea of the main courses we offer, their entry requirements, duration and the types of jobs you might obtain after gaining these qualifications. During the course of the day, I hope you will take the opportunity to talk to staff and attend information sessions for particular courses that may interest you. Some of these courses are open to school leavers, but some have particular entry requirements, so it is important to note these. Firstly, the Certificate in Psychology is offered as a six-month course for those wanting a general introduction to the subject for personal or work-related purposes. There are no specific entry requirements. At undergraduate diploma level, we provide a one-year diploma in psychology course designed for those already in employment whose work and previous training is not in psychology. There are no particular entry requirements and students in this course usually take it to help them progress into their careers. For a major in psychology, we offer a three-year degree course called a Bachelor of Arts, after which Students can go on to take other courses if they want to specialise in psychology. The only requirement for this course is the usual undergraduate admission to university. Now, 
For the more specialised courses in psychology, we offer a master's degree to be taken over 18 months. This can be by research or coursework, but entry to this programme is only through first gaining a degree in psychology. That means you must have a degree majoring in psychology. And lastly, for those wanting clinical qualifications at postgraduate level, we offer a diploma in clinical psychology over a 12-month period, usually called Clinical Psychology Diploma, for short. The minimum entry requirement for this program is an appropriate honours degree. Now look at questions 36 to 40. Listen carefully and answer questions 36 to 40. Now, it's also important that you have some understanding of the types of work these courses can prepare you for, and it's useful to know the relationship between the work you might do after you complete the course and the work of others who have studied different courses in psychology. As I said before, the certificate in psychology is for personal interest or possibly for work-related purposes, but doesn't qualify you in any particular way. Our students in this course can range from women who have stopped work to care for their children and the children have now commenced school, to the support staff in a specialised publishing company. They really vary a lot. The undergraduate diploma usually attracts people working in offices such as banks or in some government departments. If you gain a degree with a major in psychology, again, you are not professionally trained, but this could enable you to undertake further training to obtain professional qualifications, or it might just be part of a first degree that will help you to get a good job that doesn't require particular specialisation at that stage. After completing a master's degree, you would expect to have some specialisation, perhaps in research or on a particular aspect of psychology, such as child development. For those who also have a clinical diploma, there are a wide range of jobs available. Some focus on helping people with personal adjustment or family problems. Others might concentrate more on using psychological tests, or perhaps working in particular institutions, such as those for the mentally ill, or in prisons. There are many other job opportunities, so if you are interested to discuss possibilities with any of the staff today. This is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.